I'm the first to admit that I've built my entire career showing my complications, showing my mistakes, uh, which everyone in this room, admittedly or not, encounters. Fortunately, not as often as back when I started. I'm the oldest one in this room, I see. And uh, when I started, um, complications were not discussed. In fact, at every one of the main meetings, the faculty showed only their most perfect cases. And then in 1982, I introduced the video symposium. And I showed all of my torn capsules, all of my dropped nuclei, all of my positive pressure cases. It was really a calamity. Now, admittedly, we're a lot better now than we were then. I had 45 torn capsules in my first few years. I became a real expert on posterior capsule tear management. But we had can opener capsulotomies. We had a FACO machine that would do two things, maximum and minimum. Maximum would suck the patient off the table. <laughs> minimum, you'd have to look at the calendar on the wall before anything would happen. And uh, I developed slow motion FACO, which changed all that. Uh, but it didn't change Charlie Kelman, who said, don't FACO the small pupil. It was one of his key contraindications to FACO. Even back in the dark ages, we realized that complications occurred when the pupil wasn't widely dilated. I, I challenged that with, the, I think it was the, probably the initial presentation on FACOing small pupils, but that's because I had the only FACO machine in the country made by an Italian company, Opticon, that allowed us to have surgeon-controlled ultrasound, aspiration rate, vacuum, bottle height, so we could go underneath. But still, the small pupil was very intimidating, and there were articles written about how you should never tackle a pseudoexfoliation case with FACO because a third of the patients had complications. Not from the pseudoexfoliation, I think it was from the small pupil. Historically, we started off taking a piece of the iris and absolutely liberating it. We would free it from the eye forever. And we had these massive sector iridectomies. And then came the small little multiple uh, sphincterotomies. And after that came viscomadriasis, which was the first thing that really worked pretty well in some of the cases. And then peripupillary membranectomy, where we would strip the little membrane in these uveitic cases. The pupil would actually dilate after being frozen for decades. The Fry stretch technique was fantastic, one of Luther's wonderful contributions. And then we had iris hooks. And then more recently, a proliferation of new devices. My favorite being the Malugan ring. And I've worked closely with Boris. At this meeting, we'll be introducing the new injector. There wasn't much happening in pharmacology. You notice I didn't mention anything. My fellow, Bob Sioni, was the first to write a paper at Cincinnati Eye Institute on injecting midriatics into the eye to open the pupil during surgery. Subsequently, there was papers on phenylephrine. And as you all know, when David Chang described uh, floppy iris syndrome, Sugarcane became our mainstay. I was a big fan of sugarcane, a huge fan, because in Cincinnati we had an epidemic of Flomax. Everybody was on Flomax. It was like a battle to see or to pee. In Cincinnati, we would write letters to all the urologists and they would respond by giving everybody even more Flomax. <laughs> and, and I played golf with a urologist there and I said, what do you think about this Flomax business? And he said, I just started it myself. I said, why? He said, why not? Sugarcane came to our rescue. That and some of the more cohesive viscoelastics like Helen 5 that Doug Koch and I published. We had a pretty good run with sugarcane. The problem with sugarcane was it was not approved. And I don't know how many of you have been in legal cases before until I turned over all of my legal cases where I tried to help other ophthalmologists to one of my partner who is much better than I am, Michael Snyder, 
married to an attorney and he helps ophthalmologists wonderfully. But I was in enough of those cases that I saw that the lawyers didn't care. They didn't care about right and wrong. They just cared about winning the case. And now, in my opinion, if you use sugarcane and you get something totally unrelated, completely unrelated, CME, and there's a case lit that goes to litigation, the attorney will say, oh, and by the way, you use an unapproved drug? And they'll try to link that to the complication, which is completely amoral, but that's how the attorneys make their living. But I really wasn't unhappy with sugarcane until I tried Omidria. And those of you in the audience who know my, you know I can't be purchased, I can't be bought, I'm going to tell you exactly as honestly as I can what I've experienced. And it's been fantastic. It's been unbelievable. I haven't looked, it's just like when I put my first soft lens in, I never looked back regretting that I didn't have hard lenses available. And since I've been using Omidria, I've never looked back and said, gosh, where's my sugar cane? Omidria became the first approved drug. It's a combination of ketorolac and phenylephrine. It became the first approved drug for pre uh, maintaining pupil size by preventing meiosis. And they also cut a label, I believe, for reducing postoperative pain, which none of us really have much of anyway. But that was kind of an icing on the cake second label. But I welcomed Omidria because number one, I was no longer vulnerable during surgery. And I've never practiced offensive medicine, but I just didn't want to be using an unapproved substance. But number two, it worked fantastically. Now, I wasn't the only skeptic. So for Flomax, all cases. I use Omidria, all cases. For Pseudo-X, all cases. For suboptimal pupillary dilatation, all cases. Because if I get down to four millimeters, I'm putting in a ring. And uh, some of the folks here may disagree, and that will be good. Disagreement's healthy. In fact, some of the people at this table will use Omidria in all cases, and you should hear their rationale. So I'm going to start by showing you a very brief case. And then I'm going to turn it over to each one of these people who not only are they better surgeons than I am, but they're also a lot more articulate, and you're going to hear their stories on how they converted from skepticism to passion about this drug. I hope you're here tonight to see why this thing really works and why it really does help ophthalmologists. So can you please put my video on and I'll show it very quickly. It's a, it's a brief little video from last week. All right, so look, look at the size of this pupil, folks. If you don't mind, just take a quick peek at this. This is a gigantic pupil. And then I start to FACO. And this was a case right before I knew about Omidria. And what do you notice is the pupil, I mean, this is just a routine atraumatic case. And look at the pupil size. There's no Flomax, there's no nothing. So here we have what happens even when your case is a good case. Now this is a high profile patient from last week who wants a premium lens, who has Pseudo-X and Flomax. The Pseudo-X is not bad. The Flomax is really bad. So I put in Hill on 5. I get a little bit of viscomedriasis. It, it is a good video, I know. I got brand new 4K stuff two weeks ago. It's a really nice video. Okay, bevel down, and I make a groove. I love bevel down because it keeps the OVD in the chamber. Then I drop the vacuum. Then I go bevel up. I deepen the groove, and I crack the nucleus. I lower the vacuum because I don't want the OVD to disappear from the chamber. And then I embed the tip into the hemisphere, I chop, and then I'll turn the apex up. What I want you to notice is it doesn't matter if they have Flomax. 
It doesn't matter if they have a suboptimal pupil. It stays the same. But it's unbelievable. Look at this pupil. And I didn't just pick out one case. I promise you, this has been my experience with every omidria case. Every Flomax, every suboptimal pupil, until they get really small. And I just can't tell you how consistent the performance is. I had one guy in my practice, I have 50 partners, they're all we have a very busy sub-fellowship trained group. One of my partners was so hostile against Omidria, he says, I will never use that because epi sugar cane is so cheap. He tried it for the first time two, two weeks ago. He had not gone back. So look at this, this pupil hasn't done a thing. And this patient in the first eye had massive floppy iris syndrome. Horrific. And I really want this case to work. See, I took out the cortex, I vacuumed the capsule, because this, this is a VIP and he wants a premium lens. So I'm terribly obsessive compulsive. I realize by now, Rob, you would have done two cases. I, I understand that. But that's okay. To me, it's not a horse race. I want every step exactly right. And I'll use viscomedriasis to supplement my omidria, and I'll inject using autocert, a restore lens, and I'll use that Y hook, which is wonderfully safe. It's all about safety. Life is all about safety. Quality, yes, but safety. And that's the reason I accepted this position with Omidria because this, in my honest opinion, makes the surgery safer. Here's the eye at the end when I exchange the OVD. And then I put in a meiotic to bring the pupil down so I can center my restore lens. And that's the first time you've seen the pupil move is when I inject the meiotic. Here's the day after surgery. I love to center the lens using a meiotic. The lens is perfectly centered and the patient's uncorrected 20-20 at distance and near.